Hey there folks, I'm Mark, in affiliation with Spectrum Pulse, and it's the Lil Durk Album Bomb episode, and this, it's Billboard Breakdown. I, don't remember. I went back and checked. The last album bomb we got was three months ago. Does that strike anyone else as a little bit wild that the mainstream charts have felt this scattershot that so little has been able to shake up the Hot 100? And hell, that's when we get that impact. It's courtesy of Lil Durk, who's been breaking through consistently the past couple of years, but absolutely, this is his largest impact to date, albeit mostly courtesy of his guest. I don't know if it's signaling that summer is finally going to kick into gear properly, but I wouldn't be displeased if that happens. I'll all I gotta say? Of course, it all starts with our top 10, where, for another week, Last Night by Morgan Wallen holds the number one, thanks to Rock Solid Streaming and the radio, but it might have hit its limit in the latter category, as the gains have started to fall off. And this opens up a door for a new challenger, Karma by Taylor Swift, featuring Ice Spice at number two. Now, I'm a little bit shocked that Taylor went to the remix already, given that the song was on the upswing, but now it's challenging for the top spot thanks to ridiculous streaming gains, a tangible radio surge, and the influx of sales. There's still a considerable margin it has to overtake, but I would say it's in contention. That's not really something I can say for Flowers by Miley Cyrus anymore at number three, which is now firmly on the downswing, especially on the radio. But then we all saw the expected spike for All My Life by Lil Durk featuring J. Cole up to number four thanks to the streaming resurgence and some decent crossover radio gains. I don't know how long this is going to last outside of the album bomb week, but there is more here than I previously expected. Hell, it leapt past Calm Down by Rima and Selena Gomez at number 5, where it had kind of a strange week on the radio, where I thought it might be peaking until it got that last minute surge. I reckon that was what put it over Kill Bill by SZA down to number 6, which is just bleeding hard and fast. Then we saw a step back for Ella Bella Sola by Eslabon Armado and Pesa Pluma at number 7, mostly due to a slight slip on streaming, which is pretty much all it has, because radio is not getting going at all. And that opens up the door for Fast Car by Luke Combs up to number 8. It's up in all categories. It is a bona fide hit. And the fact that it is a great cover is a big shining moment in 2023, a year that's not really impressed me on the charts. Case in point, favorite song by 2C slid down to number 9, as it seems like the radio momentum screeched to a halt, and some stronger songs just bowled past it, but it wasn't up to stand over Creepin' by Metro Boomin, 21 Savage, and The Weeknd at number 10, which given the airplay collapse, it was on its way out anyway. Now this opens up the door for our losers and our dropouts, and there's a lot of them here. That's one of the benefits of album bomb weeks. They clear away so many tracks, they help some turnover. And look, I'm not about to complain that Spin Bout You by Drake and 21 Savage, Unholy by Sam Smith and Kim Petras, or Just Wanna Rock by Lil Uzi Vert are all exiting, albeit with their year-end list spots for 2023. Nor am I really going to complain that much that Nonsense by Sabrina Carpenter, Painting Pictures by Superstar Pride, Double Fantasy by Future and The Weeknd, and even Red Ruby to Sleaze by Nicki Minaj are gone well short of it. Yes, I know with Nicki's album announcement that there's a very real possibility that last song might return, but I've got no idea what's even going to be on that track list, so no expectations there. Probably going to change a half dozen times. That takes us to our healthy list of losers, the majority of which I would chalk up to Lil Durk's disruption on streaming causing a serious shake up, with only a few exceptions like Say Yes to Heaven by Lana Del Rey fading off the debut to 90. But for the return of America Has a Problem by Beyonce and Kendrick Lamar down to 54, it kinda makes sense. As does Mourning by Post Malone losing off the debut to 55. Or the welcome and continued collapse of Mathematical Disrespect by Lil Mabu at 97. Outside of that, and maybe Dancing in the Country by Tyler Hubbard on its way out at 37. The rest, I can really tack up the disrupted streaming, like Slut Me Out by Annalie Choppa, continuing down to 65, or I See You by Coco Jones at 79, or Shake Some by DaBaby at 80, or Fight the Feeling by Rod Wave at 85, or Low Down by Lil Baby at 89, or Moonlight by Kaliuchis at 96, or Trance by Metro Boomin, Travis Scott, and Young Thug at 99. It is also spilled into the Latin crossover, spanning the 
regional Mexican tracks like Fragil by Yabritza Su Incencia and Grupo Frontera at 84, and El Gordo Tre El Mando by Chino Pacas at 93, to even some of the more conventional Latin pop and reggaeton like Bezo by Rosalia and Raul Alejandro at 88, and Yando 150 by Yando and Fide at 92. And to round out all the streaming impact, a few residual Morgan Wallen songs got hit like I Wrote the Book at 95 and Man Made a Bar with Eric Church at 100. Yes, both of those songs were still around. Now on for our returns and gains. Well, there's not much of either, as one would expect. And given that I already mentioned Karma as the one gain, the only return we had was also from Taylor Swift with Snow on the Beach with Lana Del Rey up to 30. It's not clear in Billboard's attribution whether or not this is the new version of the song with more of Lana than the last one. I guess we will have to see if they eventually fix that. But we are in album bomb territory with Lil Durk and it's a big one with 14 new songs. So outside of the top 20, we're only looking at the best and worst. So outside of those, You Got Him at 86, though that one was really quite bad. B12 at 83, though I do dig this one. Lil Durk seems to do Yeet sound better than he does. Below Fajir at 82, Grandson with Kodak Black at 76, Sad Songs at 74. One of the few Lil Durk relationship songs that's actually good. 300 Urus at 73, Put Him on Ice at 72, Big Dog with Chief Wuck at 67, Never Again at 62, Never Imagined with Future at 59, that one was surprisingly good as well, and Pele Coat at 35. All right. Now for a much more reasonable selection of new arrivals, unfortunately starting with number 68, Cross the Globe by Lil Durk featuring Juice WRLD. The worst songs on Lil Durk's album are when he pulls in guests who really shouldn't be here. And with this, it's kind of a toss up what's more offensive, but tacking on a Lil Durk verse to yet another posthumous Juice Juice World song, it feels gross, made all the worse because the bass and snare mixing is so shoddy against the faded guitar. And look, Juice World was always at his worst when he was trying to be really gangsta or hard, especially on this song where he tries to get a girl to come over, she refuses to fuck him and his friend, but when he pulls the money out, she screws them both. And he then bungles the rhyme on the hook. Now his verse is pretty bad too. He was not a dealer. The comparisons to Tupac feel wildly out of pocket. He says he finger fucks his gun. And then we get the line, smoke till my eyes look like Ming no Yao. Now Lil Durk's verse is better as he's trying to be a bit more responsible and turning down 50 cents offer for a movie on the ground in Chicago where he's trying to set up scholarships to get the kids out, take the actual gang warfare there seriously. But then he references everyone he wants freed. He mentions YNW Melly. Not sure you can get away with that one, just saying. So yeah, it's bad. And the only reason this is on the album is the Juice World feature to spike up the streams. I'd skip it. Number 66, Pound Town 2 by Sexy Red, Tay Keith, and Nicki Minaj. Pound Town, just left Pound Town. Let my nigga, he just took a bitch down. Yeah, that nigga dig a bitch down. Yeah. They need to eat me out. So I'll freely admit I was not familiar with Sexy Red before this song. She's from St. Louis, she's been building up some buzz, and I'm not quite sure why she has it. Because the original Pound Town wasn't good at all. Yeah, the piano line's cool, but the percussion felt so awkwardly mixed with the glassy trap skitters, not placed evenly in the mix, and Sexy Red... Well, her flow left a lot to be desired, and the sleaze was just not very interesting. So even if the wonky mixing choices have not gone away, at least Nicki Minaj would be a significant upgrade. And, and yeah, her verse is better, even if it is just as effortlessly sleazy. But then there's that bridge, and while Nicki's been flagrant before, if the rumors are true and she's talking about Diddy, that is a mess I don't even want to try to explain. Let's make this abundantly clear. Nicki makes this better, but she doesn't make it good. Let's not make this become a thing. Number 53, Bye by Peso Pluma. You know, 
For a second, with the slower and more melancholic guitars, I thought we'd be getting something close to a regional Mexican ballad, something I really haven't heard much of before. But then those farty staccato horns flooded in against the somber acoustics, and I ran out of patience really fast. Especially as Peso Pluma's nasal singing makes him one of my least favorites to gain prominence this year. Now, to be fair, from a content standpoint, this is a ballad, where Peso Pluma commiserates about a breakup with a sort of utterly unconvincing brag that proves he's still very much on that mindset. I mean, I don't know, the horns and vocals prevent me from really liking it, but I can appreciate there's a bit more diversity here, and I'll be able to tell this song apart from a lot of the others. Call that a win? I guess? Number 43, Dance the Night by Dua Lipa. My heart could be burning, but you won't see it on my face. Watch me. So, in the most obvious choice imaginable, Dua Lipa got tasked to make a new disco song from the Barbie movie that she is in, and Mark Ronson actually stepped in to deliver some really sleek production polish, especially in those strings and with that bass line. Honestly, it's some of the more lush throwback production that Dua Lipa has ever had, and I'll admit it's a sound that really works well for me, where she tries to get over a heartbreak by being hot and dancing up a storm. Now, granted, in this lane, as of recently, I've got the immediate comparison of Jessie Ware this year, who has more elegance and tighter melodies that Dua Lipa has not quite mastered yet, and there is a part of me that feels like it's kind of stock for her. It's not bad by any means, but it's not taking any real compositional risks either to stand out, and I feel that that might be a safe misstep, even for a soundtrack hit. I just hope it's not a sign that the Barbie soundtrack plays it safe. Given how stacked it appears to be, and I would put money on a small album bomb coming from it, I was just hoping for a little bit more flair. So this is good, just not great. Number 41, War About It by Lil Durk featuring 21 Savage. He say no, I say let's go to war about it. Where you go, you better know the more again. I mean, it feels like it's kind of cheating to put this here as my favorite track from Lil Durk that charted this week, because it's hopping on a Metro Boomin' track with 21 Savage. Ergo, it's going to be one of the couple songs here that's competently and consistently mixed and mastered, and can actually create some credible dread and atmosphere, as Lil Durk makes all the loud threats against someone who betrayed him, and that person was close enough to be around his kids. And then 21 Savage highlights exactly how a ruthless killer would probably get it done, and under playing it. I think the only reason I'm not fully on board with this is because it is a formula in the keys, the operatic touches, and the spare trap beat that feels kind of driven into the ground by 21 and Metro at this point. It's a really damn solid formula, but formula nonetheless. Still really good though, even if it can feel like the antithesis of any aspirational framing on the early tracks of the album, but Lil Durk does contain multitudes. I'll give him that. Number 27, Hits Different by Taylor Swift. Okay. So the reason this is only charting now, and not within the proper deluxe framing that Taylor previously had, was this being included on the Target exclusive release. But apparently enough folks heard it and really liked it, so in the numerous and rather shameless deluxe issue that was made available for everyone, this is now here, and... oh fuck. It's great, I get why she finally releases it. Mostly because it plays to Taylor Swift at her drunkest and messiest as she tries to stagger through the aftermath of a relationship where she very much still has some feelings. But where Back to December has a plea to try to bring things back together, this is what happens when you do try to move on and it kind of blows up in your face. Where her friends can't console her, old tokens of the relationship make her cry, and once again she can't change to fit into his world, and there's even a call back to our song for when your own pop culture ubiquity becomes its own curse. When your friends stop eventually inviting you out and you worry if the madness has taken you. It's not really an easy or relatable version of Taylor. Most do not blow through guys like she does. But it's like my favorite songs on Midnight's. The messy humanity is what makes it its most compelling. Now I get why it was cut from Midnight's. The chipper pop country guitars from Aaron Dessner and Jack Antonoff that bizarrely remind me of 
three fallen in the melody the heavier percussion and the bouncy hook are just way too up tempo even as the synths well up over the hook and sound really nice kind of reminds me a bit of bleachers and that second verse it's a total mess of clunky lyricism and flubbed rhymes. But I don't know, if the choice between the next hit is between this and Karma, I think I'll take this. It's a great song. Check it out. And finally, number 22, Stand By Me by Lil Durk featuring Morgan Wallen. When there's nobody else to call, would you stand by me? Would you stand by me? At this point, it's not even the fact that Morgan Wallen and Lil Durk appear to be friends. That's their business, whatever. But can they stop making utterly terrible music together? Recruiting Dr. Luke for production, because apparently you wanted more of his washed out synthetic guitars, fake claps, and bare bone trap skitters with no texture or punch. Yeah, this is a song all about standing together with either Lil Durk or Morgan Wallen. And wow, I'm not convinced I want to go near either of them. Lil Durk goes on about how he totally didn't go to the red light district in Amsterdam, but instead found different bad bitches to hang out with, but he can explain so long as she stays loyal. But at least Lil Durk tries to sell it with some tangible desperation, you can tell that he cares, whereas Morgan Wallen is playing the same cards, but ends his verse with how if you're not gonna be that person who's ride or die for him, you should just be gone. I mean, at least Lil Durk seems to be apologetic, seems to care a little bit more. Now, if we're comparing this to Broadway Girls, I, I cannot say this is worse, because that one was just mixed like shit and the sour vibes were ugly as hell, but this is perhaps the most sterile attempt at crossover I've heard in a long time. There's a serious absence of good here, especially with Morgan Wallen putting on his best Adam Levine impression. So yeah, of course it sucks. But you know what? It's not getting the worst of the week. Dishonorable mention. Worst is going to cross the globe by Lil Durk and the late Juice World. Although I will say, Pound Town 2, it was closer than you might imagine. Now the best of the week... Honorable mention is going to Lil Durk as well, with 21 Savage, with War About It, but I gotta be honest, Taylor Swift kind of runs away with this with Hits Different. I think it's a legit great song. I get why it charted this highly. I get why it's a fan favorite. Next week, the fallout from all this, unless 2C or Moneybag Yo will see some traction with their releases. Stay tuned for that. But until then, I'm Mark. You're watching Billboard Breakdown, affiliated with Spectrum Pulse. And I'll see you next time.